there are countless factors that can lead to your death. As senior coroner, I deal with almost 4,000 fatalities a year. Royal Preston is one of the hospitals in Coroner Dr James Adeley's jurisdiction. Every single person in this mortuary that has died unnaturally is under the control of the coroner. Dr Adeley can make any inquiries necessary to find a cause of death. If the coroner instructs the police to investigate, then that is what we do. In this series, for the first time ever, we follow the full investigation and unfold the mystery of any unexplained death, from the moment of arrival in the mortuary to the final conclusion of the inquest. It's allowing families to understand how the death occurred and deal with it in their own way as part of their own grieving process. This is the last bit to find out what actually happened to him. If you die here, if it's violent, unnatural, or of an unknown cause, it's my job to find out how. I think we left Frank's about half six to go up to Leyland. And the bus shelter was like probably about 100 yards away from Frank's house. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. It was just going up Leyland, going around a few pubs, and having the crack, having a few beers. And I thought, yeah, we're going to have a good night. It's unbelievable. You know what I mean? What happened? It's like your worst nightmare. This emergency. Hi, there's two people led on the road on West Paddock in Leyland. On the road. On the road? Yeah. Right, okay. We'll get somebody to attend, all right. Now then, Frank Grimley is reported that as they've come out of the club, He's fallen off the curb and banged his head. He's either fallen, had some kind of fight or whatever. He might have picked himself up and carried on walking and then it collapsed. Coroner's officers here are employed by the police, but the service is provided by Lancashire County Council. Each morning they receive a list of everyone who has died in hospital. And on that list today, is 73-year-old Frank Brimley, who was found lying in the road. I've received a phone call today from an officer over at Chorley. A gentleman has died in ICU. Police have had involvement with him on the Saturday. So they received a call early on Saturday morning of two elderly men in the road. One of the gentlemen had a cut above his eye, he was fine, but the other one lost consciousness and became unresponsive. The circumstances at the moment, we're not quite sure what's happened because the friends said that they've been out drinking. So we don't know whether they may have had an altercation. We don't know whether they've fallen over drunk and he's banged his head. We don't know whether there may be a third party involved. We, we just don't know. When Frank Brimley was brought into hospital, he was given a CT scan before he died. For the coroner's investigation, this might provide vital clues to what happened. This gentleman's died basically of uh, a large intracranial hemorrhage. This is a CT scan of the brain, which shows there's an area of bleeding within the brain, which is this whiter area. And then surrounding that, you've got a darker uh, ring, which is uh, some swelling of the brain tissue. Soft tissue swelling down here. And sometimes you get bleeds opposite to the area that was banged. It's what's called a contra coup injury. So uh, it does have some evidence that he might have banged his head there. And if somebody pushed him and he banged his head, then that's, you know, that changes the, the picture slightly. We 
are concerned that there might be foul play, given the, the circumstances of them being found in the roads. It's quite unusual um, to, for, for two people to be lying in the road in the dark at that time of night. What I need to establish is whether there's been any kind of dispute, any kind of third party involvement that's resulted in them falling in the road, or whether there's been some kind of road traffic collision. Ultimately, we just need to make sure that Frank hasn't been unlawfully killed. What's your name? Frank. Yeah. Frank Brimley. Are you put them straight? At a certain time of the night, everything becomes hazy, and I probably can't remember anything after that. Nothing at all. Obviously, you think you might have done something. I feel as it's my fault. And, you know, I could have caused it. Frank, hey, wait for me. external examination we always need a ruler because they'll like measure scars bruises maybe some marks pm40 that's the main knife used within an invasive post-mortem that either myself or the pathologist would use i think people like the outside world I don't think they realise the extent of how many people die a day. No, there's a massive taboo about death, though, to yeah. start talk about it. No. And I think it is a normal part of life. Yeah. And it is sad, but, and, but it is a normal part. Yeah. You know, obviously, we deal with, like, you know, six, seven patients who die a night, every single night. So if you let that get to you, you'd never be able to do the job and you'd never be able to get up in the morning. I used to say to my daughter when she was really young, she'd say, what do you do? I used to say, I'm like a nurse that works with people who are obviously never going to get better. We're getting there. Yeah, we've been here since Sunday. Uh, the Midlands, near Coventry. Because Frank came from the Midlands. Frank Brimley was a widower with no children. His goddaughters have arrived from Nuneaton to clear his flat. Right, have these ones been done? Yeah. Just that one and that one. Have you done that? Yeah, I've wiped that out. I've got to get them rugs up as well. There's rugs yeah. everywhere in the house. So we've obviously got to empty the property and hand the keys in on Friday. And so we've literally got three or four days to empty the flat. I don't think we've even had time to No. Clean. Just not, not had time to think about it. I mean, I've got really fond memories of him. He was a nice man, yeah. He had a heart of gold. His social life was yeah. going to the pub, karaoke. He didn't like spending money on stuff that weren't important. No. You know, he'd rather go out and have fun with his money. Frank Brimley is a 73-year-old gentleman who collapsed in the street and he'd got a bleed in the right frontal lobe of his brain. And unfortunately, as the bleed continued, the pressure inside his head began to rise. Now, this is particularly problematic because your skull is a fixed box, and when you raise pressure inside the head, it forces your brainstem out of the bottom of your brain, and that interrupts all the centers that maintain your breathing, your heart rate, and you will not survive. The rank is on the Monday morning. But he said he's had another massive bleed this morning and we advised that you turn off the machine. So there was only the two of us, weren't there? We was together and we said, we need to do the right thing, don't we? We need to turn off the machine, don't we? So we held his hand, didn't we? And, then we and we thought, played some music. We loved music, so we asked Alexa, <laughs> just play some random 60s music. So we turned his machine off at quarter to four and by four o'clock he died. Just heartbreaking. This not noise having to chuck people's things away and we didn't sign up for this, you know, and having to make a decision to turn somebody's life support machine off. It's not nice. 
Yes, then. Well, we know that he went out with his friend drinking, so he'd fell over, brought his friend down, and it had gone from there. Were they just fumbling along and fell? But then they fall. kept saying about the trauma. Yeah. So to us, that was a blow to the head. So we've had so many mixed messages, we don't really know. No. So yeah. what did happen? Oh, oh. Yeah, oh, that. oh my God, how the hell did we manage to get that in? Oh. Frank Brimley. Dear Alice, come up, new paragraph. Could you let me know where we are at with obtaining a statement from the neurosurgeon? Please, question mark. Dr Aidley has asked the police to investigate the possibility of any third-party involvement. He will now need to wait for their conclusions. Coroners are only involved in deaths that are in some way unnatural. Basically, there is something unusual about the death. There is something that is not a natural disease process involved with the death. The police are interested in deaths that are suspicious and may be due to criminal activity. Now, the two may overlap, in which case the police take precedence because they have specific rules of evidence and have to comply with these. <laughs> Frank Brimley is not the only case that the coroner's team are investigating. In Preston City Centre, an unresponsive male has been found in the gardens of a public house. He died shortly after arriving in hospital. I've been asked to attend a scene this morning following the report of a sudden death. The male was located around about this spot, so it's up against the boundary wall and just to the side of this hedge. Our uniformed colleagues are usually first on scene at an incident like this because it's called in as an emergency incident, and then they've asked for CID to be made aware. And our role is initially to establish that there's no third party involvement and then to carry out the investigation on behalf of the coroner. So currently, the male is completely unidentified, so there's no personal identification documents with him. We also have no witnesses in relation to the incident. It was a freezing cold night, and the man was found only wearing a T-shirt and jogging pants. We are going to the mortuary. I've got a gentleman in who is, at the moment, unidentified. He came into A&E where he was pronounced dead. We just have them as unknown unknown, so we're just on our way to the mortuary to change the tags so that they match all our paperwork. Please, may I change the tags from Alpha Papa to unknown unknown? This case, in this day and age, is very unusual. If you think about the amount of identification that you may have where you live, your wallet, your bank cards, your mobile phone, all sorts of information is on you. This man had absolutely none of these. So no one knows him. It's really weird, isn't it? And everyone so far that's been rung in, they've been able to locate, okay. yeah, or discount because it doesn't match. When somebody dies and there is no obvious next of kin because you don't have an identification the coroner will take control of the body i retain control of the body until my investigations are complete and then it's released we'll wait a couple of weeks to see what leads that we get to come in we will then do a body map of his marks and scars his tattoos get um, a dental map of his teeth um, and submit that with a full description of him to the UK Missing Persons database. And then eventually, if we still have no one come forward, we'll have to refer him to environmental health at the council to carry out his funeral, unfortunately, as an unknown male. It's been 48 hours since the death of Frank Brimley, and at the coroner's office, Investigations are continuing into the circumstances surrounding his fall. Hello, Alice. Hi. You've okay? got some more information about Frank Brimley. Oh, right, yes. Um, so I think doctor's statement suggests he fell outside of the oh, pub. Oh, the Conservative Club, yeah. Yeah. Um, however, the MWAS sheet, I think, has a different address on. 
Right. So they're just conflicting, really. What I'll do is I've told the police that we just need to get CCTV of the Conservative Club. I'll contact the police this morning, see where about to up to, and yeah. then I'll let you know. Is that OK? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Hello, you OK there? Lisa Licenson. Two gentlemen. Yeah, right, I've um, got it ready for you. I know it is. It's Frank. Right, no yeah. problem. I uh, believe he came in twice. Yeah, they were playing pool. Yeah, you're right. Not back door. Games room. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Them. That's them. So, at about five past eight, they've just come in and they've just started playing pool. And I'm sure he left around nine-ish. Oh, that's... 2046. So, yeah, this will be invaluable because it then means I can go back to other premises and narrow down the search that little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So, you don't have to mess about as much. Oh, he's back. From what I've been told, this is the last place they visit. And then we know they leave at around about 13 minutes past midnight, don't they? So sad as well. I would tell him at front door, so he was on about coming in for karaoke on Saturday. Cos he, he liked his music, Frank. Right. Love music. I gave him a hug at the end of the night. It's been 24 hours since the unidentified man's death. So the plan now is to do a press release and social media release with the details that we've got. So what I do is put a detailed description together. So it's got his approximate age, height, and then the description of the tattoos on his forearm. It's also got some surgery scars on there as well. So hopefully they'll be the trigger for somebody's memory, somebody's thoughts, as a way of getting this male identified. There's always a lot of interest with these things on Facebook. Obviously, there's a lot of people saying how sad it is, a lot of people saying how awful it is for the family to find out over a press release, but we wouldn't do this if we hadn't exhausted all the other avenues. We just really want to find out who he is and find his family. I live here where we grew up, and Frank lived about six doors down at his grandma and granddad's. So I've known him, you know, 68 years. He was like easygoing and like happy go lucky. And, and that was Frank. So I got there at two o'clock on the Friday afternoon, and he'd done me some cheese on toast, just sat down there talking, and then he said, like, what do you want to do tonight? So I said, yeah, I'd just as soon as like stay around here and then have a Chinese or a chippy. He said, no, we're going to go up Leyland. Probably midnight, half 12. We'd had a fair bit to drink. I think after a certain point, everything's gone. I can just remember all the police cars there in a huddle, sort of converging to us like a random circle. Have you your head to me, Frank? Yeah. Apparently, I said, I think Frank's dying. So I must have been in a position to look at him on the floor. But I can't remember that. I can't remember saying that. Whether Frank tripped, brought me down or I tripped and brought him down but you know you don't know what's happened you know you could have had an argument and when like the police come round to interview you you think like you might be under suspicion and you, yeah I did yeah that worried me 
it's not fair on the families just to be told we found your loved one lying in the streets and unfortunately he's dead. They need to know more than that. They need to know how he's come to be lying in the street and what is the cause of death. How are we doing? Oh, my God. They need answers. We need to make sure, as investigators, that there is no foul play and then we can feed that back to the families and also feed it to the coroner and the coroner will decide whether the death was natural, unnatural or even in some cases refer it back to the police if the coroner feels it needs further investigation. Hi, Frank. Sad. Sad and I feel like we've chucked him in the, in the tip, you know, his belongings. It's really sad. You know, now we can um, obviously put him to bed. But this was heartbreaking. Really heartbreaking. You can set me off now. I know. <laughs> sorry, sorry. We're just so tired. I think that's the problem as well, yeah. isn't it? Been exhausted. And knowing you'll never come here again. And CID. Right, OK. If you leave that with me, I will uh, hopefully get to the bottom of it. So it looks like we've got uh, an identification for the unidentified male at the hospital. Police received a call from a family reporting their husband missing. The police have gone round and based on the information they took for the missing report, they believed it to be this male that was found on Wednesday. The point of contact will be his brother and I've just made a phone call to him to ask him if he's willing to come to the hospital to assist with doing a formal identification. When we go through, if you can just confirm that yes, it is John, and then once that's done, I'll come back out and I'll leave you to spend some time with him. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Are you all going through together? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's John. Yeah. So that's John, yeah? Yeah. OK. So if I leave you now to spend a bit of time with him. OK. You're right, Louise. Oh, such a shame. I've wanted up there a while now. We'll find out, won't we? We'll find out. Yeah. Come on. Come on, Lazy. We'll find out. The next stage now will be that now I've got the form identification, I'll do an email to the coroner to confirm that yourself has identified John to me, and then we can progress to the next stage, which will be the CT post mortem. Does John have any middle names? No. So it's just John Hutton? Yeah. It's probably one of the most difficult things that you have to do is to do a formal identification, but we'll do our best to try and find out how he's come to be there for you. OK. Yeah. All right. Police are still investigating the circumstances around Frank Brimley's last night out. What I'm looking at here is CCTV from the Conservative Club at Leyland. 
Graham comes out and sits on a, a low wall outside the club, and then he's joined by Frank. And it looks like they are possibly waiting for a taxi, and they sit there for a good 15, 20 minutes before they both get up and they both walk off through Leyland Town Centre. And then we next pick them up on camera on West Paddock outside Leyland Civic Centre. I'm trying to establish whether there was any problems that night, whether he got involved in any disputes, whether there was any fights with anyone, whether there was any arguments with anyone. Was he assaulted before he was found in the road? The next bit of footage is from a private residence on West Paddock at Leyland. You wouldn't be able to identify them from the footage uh, if it wasn't for Graham's uh, footwear, because he has a nice bright white pair of trainers on. They walk along here, and it's just about as they go into the shadows on the, the top left-hand corner here that they go off camera for about four minutes. And it's that period of time where we don't really know what's happened to them. It's just too dark to see them. Now that John Hutton has been identified, the coroner must find out how he died. Yesterday, I met family at the mortuary to do the formal identification of the unidentified male that was found last Wednesday. Uh, family have confirmed it is that of John Hutton. So I'm just going over to the mortuary now to attach the new wristbands to John so they can marry everything up ready for the CT scan to be done this afternoon. John and me, it was love at first sight. I was 16 and John was 20. He was my first boyfriend. And we've been together for 35 years. I knew that he was going to be the one for me, though, you know, John. We'd be together forever. I feel guilty that I wasn't with him, you know, when he died. I would have rather been with him. Because I'm staying with my mum, it's probably easier for me to keep going, you know, because I'm not on my own. A few times, Caroline said they were in town and perhaps he would have gone, they'd lost each other, and he would go to his friends for a couple of nights and then come back, you know, but it, and Caroline didn't think anything of it this time when that happened, when he didn't come back. Uh, but I'd seen this article in the paper earlier about a missing person. They were trying to identify, the police trying to find who this person was. I never, never thought it was John. I couldn't work out why John w was found with just a T-shirt on and where'd he been all night. And he'd gone out on Tuesday and he'd had a, a jacket on. Just a bit of a mystery, really. John Hutton received emergency treatment both at the scene and in hospital before he died. Now he is having a post-mortem CT scan in the iGene scanning suite. Preston is one of the few places in the country who use a digital CT scanner designed to give a cause of death without the need for an invasive post-mortem. We found a pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung, on the left side of his chest. However, he has had a chest strain inserted, which we can also see on the scan. That's the pneumothorax. And then just coming in here, just this bit, is the chest strain. Also, this white blob you can see here, that's a little bit of calcium in his uh, right coronary artery. So we will be doing a calcium score on him. In the Frank Brimley case, the coroner has to gather as much evidence as possible to establish how he died. Police have asked for a statement from the first person on the scene that night. They were just exactly on this area, you know. So Graham was just over there and he was sitting on... Frank was sitting on this side. 
they could have been run over, you know, because he was like uh, halfway into this side of road. I, I don't know. It, it was it was terrifying, you know. When I saw them, you know, like on the floor, so I was just thinking, what's going on? But by the time I put them in the car, there was a police lady there, so she just tried to, you know, ask their names and stuff. Frank. I didn't realize on any point, you know, he's gonna, he's not gonna make it or he's gonna die. No. Frank was deteriorating, so an ambulance was called. Before it came, another officer arrived on the scene. I'm an operational firearms commander for Lancashire Police, and because I'm an armed officer, that's why I would have to withhold my identity. Uh, we were at another incident involving uh, a group of men fighting with hammers in a neighbouring town, but it's on the same radio channel as this incident with Mr Brimley. We've laid out coats and blankets on the floor and I've seen that his oxygen levels are very low and his heart rate is very high. Putting him in the recovery position and keeping him warm resolved his oxygen levels and steadied his heart rate. It's OK. It's OK, but it's OK. Just relax. Yeah. OK, you all right? Just relax for me. I'm talking to him because I know that he can hear me. He can hear everything that's going on, all our conversations, and I'm asking him to move his right hand. And you can see his, his hand, his right hand slightly moving. I knew he was seriously ill at this point. You go there to keep someone alive. Um, you've done everything you can. Um, and sometimes it, it, it's just not enough. Coroner's officer is calling John Hutton's brother to update the family with the possible cause of death. Hello. Hi, Muir, it's Alice, coroner's officer. Okay. I'm just going to let you know the results of the CT post-mortem have come back. What yeah. they've said is there is a degree of coronary artery disease, but they're going to await the results of the toxicology before giving their final cause of death. So. The results of the toxicology probably won't come back for about 10 to 12 weeks. Oh, OK. The coroner has ordered tests to establish whether any substances contributed to John's death. There are so many unanswered questions about, you know, what led to his disappearance and where had he been at the time. You know, it was, it was a very cold night, it was wet. He wasn't dressed appropriately, he was t-shirt and jogging pants. You know, I, he was my younger brother, so it was my responsibility to look after him and, uh, and certainly in the, in the earlier years, you know, tried to help John, guide him. But again, something about John, he, he, he had his own mind and he had his own ways and um, that's certainly substances, let's say, and alcohol were, you know, part of that. I did expect something like this for John. In fact, I guess, I guess one of the surprises it didn't happen sooner. To me, that was probably the only surprise. I'm going to do like a little memorial garden. So this is where the canopy is going to go, so it's sheltered. And Frank's, Frank's ashes will be there. Frank's friend, Graham, is still unable to remember the events leading to Frank's death. The lady in the Conservative Club says she came outside to smoke and you were sitting on the wall. And that's what she said, it was before 12 o'clock, yeah. but we can't understand what happened between 12 and almost 2 when he got yeah, to A&E. Yeah. Because she wasn't that we far away to... from the club. Well, yeah. no. Sue came to me and, and A&E rang to say, wasn't it, it was about 10 to 2. Yeah. 
Yeah, and obviously then Sue just come and said she hadn't got much sense out of yeah. you. She said you, you obviously you were drunk. Yeah. And then obviously when I rang you in A&E, it wasn't much better. But we were confused whether it was your alcohol or had you had a bang to the head. Yeah, I actually, sense I actually no, said I, I, to you, didn't I, that I thought, had you been jumped? Yeah, had you somebody been mugged? attacked you both? You no, said to me when because, I was there, no. Yeah, you'd have, but been, you you'd have had more damage than that, wouldn't you? Well, you don't know, do you? Is, well, you so we've got so many you, questions that... It would just be nice to get some answers. It's harder for us and it's frustrating for us because Graham can't remember, you know, and we want him to remember, you know, and little bits are coming back out. So we've got to rely on CTV cameras. And you're trying to build a picture of what's happened. So we're hoping that the inquest have got all the answers to our questions because that's the only way we're ever going to find out, I think. Coroner's officer, I was speaking. Uh, Alice, can I just give you a quick update on the uh, on the Frank Brimley death, please? We've recovered the CCTV from the town centre, um, and I have up the mind that, that we're not looking at any kind of foul play or third party involvement. That's perfect. That's fine. The police investigation into Frank Brimley's case has ended with no criminal element. But because it is not clear how he has died, there will be an inquest to determine the cause of death. It will be held at the coroner's court in Preston. The ultimate aim of today is to answer four questions. Who's died, where and when the death occurred, and how the death occurred. How the death occurred is the more difficult question. In this case, we don't have any evidence of whether he fell or whether or not he had a stroke. If he falls, that's an accidental death. If he has had a stroke, that is a natural death. Mr. Raymond. Yeah. Super. George, call me. I'll take you upstairs. So what will happen is the coroner will open up the inquest. He'll call the witnesses up one by one. Once all the witnesses have been heard, the coroner will do a summing up of all the information he's heard in the inquest before giving his conclusion. Right, I'm going to have to get you to call up to know the coroner's key to start. Okay. <laughs> My condolences to all of Mr Brimley's friends and goddaughters, and I'm sorry that you're attending court under these circumstances. Could you tell me your full name, please, and the position you hold? Yes, my name's Gregory John Hall. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon at the Royal Preston Hospital. When we looked at the CT scan, although he has a blood clot in the brain, it's not particularly big. And if this were all caused by a head injury, I wouldn't have expected him to have had such a severe weakness of the left-hand side. I think the cause of death is probably that he's had a stroke. So can I just clarify that you believe he had a stroke and that caused the bleed? It wasn't a trauma that caused the stroke? Yes, I think that's right. What I propose to record is that Frank Brimley sustained a spontaneous stroke and was admitted to Royal Preston Hospital, where he died on the 22nd of November, 2021. I was really worried about what the outcome was going to be. If I hadn't have gone up that weekend, he could have still died in the flat on his own. And that would have been, you know, that would have been catastrophic, although he still died. You know, that was a relief to me that I didn't sort of uh, contribute to it. Psychology results have taken 12 weeks to come back for John Hutton. There is evidence for the potentially fatal use of amphetamines. There's also evidence of the antidepressant fluoxetine. 
The combination of the fluoxetine and the amphetamine increases the risk of the serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome happens when you have too much serotonin, which is a normal chemical that your body produces, and it's usually caused by taking drugs or medications that affect your serotonin levels. It can cause confusion, it can cause seizures, and it can cause a very high body temperature. That's ultimately led to his death. I've been doing this job for 18 years now. I've never come across serotonin syndrome before. This is a first. It's the very unusual reaction between a prescribed drug and a social drug, and the body heats up until the brain gets so hot that it doesn't function and you collapse and die. John's running a risk that he didn't know the risk was even there. He was a good brother. There were lots of good times. He was a character, and he was pretty wild. Since John's death, really, I mean, my thoughts have been more about remembering the, um, I guess, the younger years when, when things were better. I think he had a good soul, really. I sort of, like, talked to him, you know, I just say, miss, like, I miss you and I love you, things like that, yeah. Because he, he did look after me, you know what, he did, he cared. And I'll never forget him, I'll never. Honestly, I don't think I've ever seen the beach here so calm. No, nor me. I've never seen it empty like this See. either. It's very peaceful. Very, it very, very peaceful. Nice. I'll keep speaking to him as if he's actually sat there. Well, he is. He'd love it, all this attention, wouldn't you? Yeah. Like I say, I wish it was him, but... Oh, no. The funeral was a nice day. We, you know, we paid plenty of tributes to him that we could. Um, he had asked, obviously asked for a lot of requests, bizarrely, and we carried out all his requests that we could, hence us being here today, putting his final celebration to plan. We made a promise to him. We loved him. We wanted to do what he asked us to do. We wouldn't have let him down, and I hope we've done you proud. And I'm sure we have. I'm sure he'd be so proud of us. <laughs> 